Hello, my name's Daniel Cartwright and I'm head gardener here at the University's Winterbourne House and Garden and I've been invited to take you on a short virtual tour of the garden this afternoon. However, I would like it to be a guided tour with a difference and although I'll give you some information about the history of the house and garden as we walk, I'd also like to walk for brief periods in silence when we can all consider the positive impact that green spaces like ours can have upon our mental health and well-being and in particular the enormous pleasure that can be derived from simply observing nature in a garden such as ours. The walled garden as we're about to see is a really nice place to begin with the history of the house and garden not least of all because it's one of our best surviving examples of the original Edwardian garden design. The house and garden were built in 1904 for a wealthy local family called the Nettlefolds, John and Margaret Nettlefold. John was a wealthy local industrialist, a son of one of the founding members of Guest Keen and Nettlefold, a large manufacturing firm headquartered in Birmingham. Margaret was a Chamberlain by birth and was in fact Joseph Chamberlain's niece. The house and some of the hard landscaping features that you can see were designed by local arts and crafts architect Joseph Lancaster Ball. But perhaps more interesting to me as a head gardener is to understand the inspirations and influences behind the garden's design. The garden itself was designed by Margaret Nettlefold, inspired by the work of Gertrude Jekyll, the preeminent arts and crafts garden designer in the Edwardian period. In the Nettlefold's time, the walled garden would have been used exclusively for vegetable production and later became a rose garden. Today, although a few roses remain, it's predominantly planted with extremely colourful, summer flowering herbaceous perennials. You'll notice either side of the archway, one of the walled garden's most striking features in a moment. This is what we call the crinkle crankle wall, or sometimes known as a serpentine wall. These indentations create a slight microclimate, extremely useful for ripening wall trained fruit. And here you can see that we have some summer fruit fruiting, cordon trained apples and pears. Winterbourne's third and final private owner, John MacDonald Nicholson, died in 1944 and upon his death bequeathed the house and garden to the University of Birmingham when the University's Department of Botany assumed responsibility for the management of the garden. Subsequently, alongside our brilliant original Edwardian features, there's also evidence of the Department of Botany's impact upon the garden still evident today. Perhaps the most notable of which is this building in front of us now that we now refer to as the Gilbert Orchid House, but when it was constructed in the 1960s by the University's Department of Botany, it was actually called the Briatron. This building was built to face north and was built for the British Antarctic Survey who were sending back specimens from their expeditions to the University of Birmingham to be researched upon. However, rather than the Orchid House, it's the Alpine House that I'd like to take you in today.
Perhaps the most interesting plants in flower at the moment in Haya are our brilliant pink and white flowered Cyclamen coom. Not only do they have brilliant pink and white flowers, but also lovely glaucous blue kidney shaped leaves. These are the spring flowering cyclamen or sow bread so called because apparently hungry pigs are rather fond of the corms which they often find when foraging that rest underground from which the plant emerges. There are two commonly grown species of cyclamen in this country the spring flowering cyclamen coom and this one here that we call cyclamen heterofolium. In botanical Latin heterofolium means leaves like an ivy and I think you can see why. Unlike cyclamen coom, cyclamen heterofolium flowers in the autumn. On my right hand side you'll see what we now call the geographical beds in which different geographical zones of the world are represented including Asia, Europe, Australasia and North America. These were designed by the Department of Botany in the 1960s as an aid to teaching and contain many important tree species mostly planted in the 1960s. Perhaps the most striking is our giant Wellingtonia, the dark conifer that you can see on the right hand side of the shot. This is about 15 to 20 metres tall now and was actually planted much later in the 1980s. It's so striking because in their native habitat in the Sierra Nevada foothills in California, this species can actually exceed 90 metres tall. And now we'll enter Edgebaston Wood, a semi-natural beech woodland containing beech trees which we believe to be around 300 years old.
Edgebaston Pool forms far, part of our shared boundary with the neighbouring estate Edgebaston Old Hall and our visitors enjoy coming here to watch the waterfowl that visit the pool on a daily basis. The 40 metre long pergola we are about to walk beneath was actually built in the 1930s by Winterbourne's third and final private owner John MacDonald Nicholson. Built in the arts and crafts style you'll see many similar examples in other famous arts and crafts gardens up and down the country. Restored in 2005, it is now planted with a variety of climbing vines including ornamental grape vines and brilliant purple flowered wisteria. One key feature of arts and crafts garden design is that gardens designed in that mode often begin very formally around the house and then descend almost imperceptibly into the natural landscape beyond the further away from the architecture you walk. And I think you'll agree as we do that journey in reverse back up towards the house, leaving the woodland behind us, that our garden here at Winterbourne is a very good example of this design technique.
having returned to Winterbourne House and with the sun now going down I think that's an appropriate time to finish this short virtual guided tour. I hope you've enjoyed walking with me and reflecting upon the pleasures of observing nature in a garden such as Winterbourne and also the positive impact that doing so can have upon our mental health and well-being. Thank you. Goodbye.